All right, we're going to pick up verse 24. Paul says, I'm glad when I suffer for you in my body. (laughs) I'm glad when I suffer for you, Colossian church. When I suffer for you in my body, for I am participating in the sufferings of Christ that continue for his body, the church. So Paul knew that Jesus had suffered for humanity's sake. He was, you know, being beat, when he was being whipped, when he had to carry the cross, when he was malnourished, when he was threatened, when he was insulted. Jesus suffered for humanity's sake. Now, Paul was suffering for spreading the message of Jesus Christ, but he found it something to be super glad about for some weird reason. Paul was saying, Jesus Christ suffered for humanity's sake so that they could be saved. But now I'm suffering for humanity's sake so that more people can hear the message, the gospel found in Jesus Christ. Remember that he's in Rome. He's in a prison. He's under house arrest. He's writing this letter and he's suffering. And so Paul loved people so, so much that as long as people were getting saved, even in his suffering, the joy of seeing people reach eternity outweighed the pains of the suffering. And this ties with what Jesus said when he preached his most famous sermon on the mount. And this is where Jesus said, God blesses those who are persecuted for doing right, for the kingdom of heaven is theirs. That's a powerful, powerful message that Jesus preached. And Paul is kind of paralleling, if that's a word, he's speaking parallel to that part of the sermon that Jesus preached while he was alive. So if in this season you were suffering in any type of way, but you're also advancing the kingdom of God and you're allowing souls to be reached for Jesus. Let me tell you, this verse, Matthew 5.10, is for you. So take heart and hope in it. Jesus says, God blesses those who are persecuted for doing right. For the kingdom of heaven is theirs. So God is telling you, he blesses you if you are suffering And if you are suffering for doing something that is right, not suffering because you made a bad decision, okay? There's a difference between suffering because you're paying your own consequence. And there's a difference between you suffering for doing what is right. And if this is you, I want to tell you that Jesus is saying, hey, you are blessed by God. The kingdom of heaven is yours. Amen. And then Paul writes, verse 25, God has given me the responsibility of serving his church by proclaiming his entire message to you, Colossian church. So God has given him this responsibility. So now here's something very interesting. Paul is saying, I have a responsibility. I have a burden. I have a heart towards teaching you the gospel. Even if I don't know you, even if I've never met you, I have a heart, I have a burden, and I take this responsibility with joy, with gladness, even if this responsibility is causing suffering in my life. But as long as you're getting to know Jesus, as long as people are being reached and people are being saved, I I, I feel like this is a call and a responsibility and a heart that I could never run away from, no matter how hard it gets, no matter how tough it becomes, no matter how heavy the pressure becomes in my life. I have a call, I have a responsibility, and I'm happy. See, Paul wasn't me-centered. He's teaching us something about our faith and our salvation, and that is that our salvation shouldn't turn us towards self, but it should turn us towards God and people. A lot of Christianity nowadays can be turned into, what can God do for me? And how can my life, my call, my purpose, my bank account, my influence, my power get bigger and better? And that's why Paul writes to the Corinthian church, And he says, anyone who belongs to Christ has become a new person. This is called salvation, right? He just summed up salvation. The old life has gone and a new life has begun. This is transformation that God brings into you when you get saved. And all of this is a gift from God who brought us back to himself through Christ. This is what Colossians say. Christ is the reason why we're saved and why we're transformed. And then here he writes next what our cause is for our salvation. He says, and God has given us this task of reconciling people to him. For God was in Christ. Remember, God was in Christ. This is Jesus is God. God is Jesus. For God was in Christ, reconciling the world to himself, right, through the cross, no longer counting people's sins against them. So it's no longer because of our behavior. It's because of Christ that God cannot judge us. God cannot judge us or punish us. 
Jesus took that on a cross for you and I. And then he gives us as a conclusion where he says, and God gave us this wonderful message of reconciliation. So God is calling us. Do you understand? Yes. God is calling us to have a heart for the cause. To love people and to serve them. But we can easily make the gospel about what can God do for me instead of what can God do through me. Uh Uh Have you noticed that most of Christianity nowadays is how I can get better? What God can do for me? What God can bring to me? What doors God can open for me? What what opportunities I can have? It's it's, it's, it's all me-centered. And Paul, through the second Corinthian letter... Is telling us it's it's when you get saved, you are actually given a responsibility that is not about you. Mm. It's not about your call. It's not about how pretty you are. Mm. It's not about how much God could use you. And it's not about how humble you can be. And it's not about how spiritual and how knowledgeable you can become. Yeah. Paul's saying, you, you were saved so that you can carry a heart for the cause. Mm. And that is... To share the message of reconciliation. To reconcile men to God through Jesus Christ. But instead, we sometimes fall under, what can God do for me? When in reality, our question should be, what can God do through me? And this is where I'm going to take a couple of seconds, maybe minutes, to tell you about our summer nights. Hey. See, we, we have a goal. And as a church, the reason why we set goals for ourselves, and our leadership knows this, the reason why we set our goals for ourselves is because goals help us energize our focus. Yeah. Amen. Without goals, we're just repeating good things all the time, and we don't know if we're progressing or if we're staying the same or if we're regressing. Yeah. So we have goals. Yeah. And part of the goal for this summer, in this quarter that's coming up, um, this year of 2021 is that we want to have something called summer nights where we're going to play the series titled the chosen every midweek for about four weeks. We're going to be doing two episodes a night and we're going to rent some type of space outdoors. We're going to put some screens on and we're going to watch this series about Jesus. We're going to use this time to have an outdoor event in the summer so that we can invite our friends our closest friends our family members to come watch the series and join us for midweek while we watch The Chosen yeah. on a screen. Yes. And the purpose is that we want to share this message of reconciliation yes. with those that surround us. Yes. Because we have to be a church that moves. Yes. We have to be a church that builds. We have to be a church that reaches people. One of our values is reach. And we want to use our creativity. We want to use our strength. We want to use our energy. We want to use our hearts. We want to use whatever resource we have available to us to reach souls so that they may be reconciled to God through Jesus. And that's what Summer Nights is going to be all about. So we're going to take our blankets. We're going to take our chairs out. We're going to put our screens up. We're going to rent parkades or underground parking lots maybe. I don't know. We're going to try to make it something super cool. We're going to try to maybe rent a field somewhere, put up the screens, put some speakers on, and boom, bring people. Maybe have a small concession stand. Everything, you know, packaged, obviously, with water bottles and all that type of stuff that's packaged sanitary so that we could be under the COVID-19 restrictions, stipulations. But we want to do something because we've understood that the gospel and the reason why we're saved is not for us. It is, yes, in part, so that we can be saved. But after we are saved, we must bring this message of reconciliation to others just like Paul. He he, he loved people so much. And he had joy, even though he was suffering. Even though he was going through a difficult trial or a tough moment or a tough season in life. So if you're going through a tough season, a tough trial, just want to remind you that you are blessed. Blessed are those. That for my sake are persecuted mm-hmm. when they do right. Mm-hmm. So if you're advancing the kingdom of God, Amen. you're building the church. Yeah. You're bringing people to Jesus. You're praying for people to be saved. Yeah. Oh my gosh, let me tell you, blessed are you. Hallelujah. So what this message of reconciliation looks like, we're going to read in verse 26. Um, it says, this message was kept secret for centuries and generations past. But now it has been revealed to God's people. So back then... 
the only way that you can get to God was if you were um, a Jew. Before Jesus steps into the scene, if you were Jewish, you had no access to God. There's no way for you to get there. And if you wanted access to God, you first needed to be a Jew. Second, you would need to have a temple. Because through the temple, you can access the sacrificials or the sacrifices, sacrifices of a lambs or an animal so that the bloodshed of that animal could forgive and redeem your sin. So if you were not a Jew and you had no access to the temple, which you didn't, because we're all not Jews. I mean, if you're Jew in here, if you're from Israel, we love you, we bless you. But if you weren't back in the day, guess what? You would, you, you would have no way of having forgiveness of sin. It would be impossible for you to ever have access to God. So if you wanted access to God, you needed to be a Jew. You would need a temple. But then Jesus steps in and Jesus becomes that sacrifice Hallelujah. once and for all. So Paul continues, for God, the reason, for God wanted them, meaning Israel, to know that the riches and glory of Christ are for you Gentiles too. Hallelujah. That's why Jesus steps in. Because back then it was only Jews. And so you and I, if we're not Jews, we're titled as Gentiles. Gentiles had no access to God. But God wanted us. God wanted us to be a part of his plan. And so he sends, he sends Jesus to down a cross. And so now all humanity has access to God. We don't need sacrifices. And we also don't need temples. And this is the secret. Christ, in other translations, it's mystery. Christ lives in you. See, you are now the temple of the holy God. You don't need to go to a building or a sacred place to find access to God through Jesus Christ. You can be in the dirtiest place. You can be in a low valley. You could be in your room. You could be at a bus stop. You could be at a coffee shop. You could be anywhere. And you have access to God because God, through Jesus, made you the temple of this holy God. This is why the kingdom of God is unshakable. This is why the kingdom of God can never cease to exist. Because as long as there are hearts, as long as there are souls that are connected to him, there is a kingdom that resides in It's not an earthly kingdom. Our hearts are the kingdom of God. And this gives you assurance, he says, of sharing his glory. So now you and I carry this hope in us. We carry this good news in us. And we carry it for a purpose. To have a heart for the cause. Verse 28, our final verse says, So we tell others about Christ, warning everyone and teaching everyone. With all the wisdom God has given us, we want to present them to God perfect in a relationship to Christ. Now, the word perfect doesn't really mean the literal translation of the English language perfect without mistake or without sin. The word perfect here in the original means maturity. So Paul is saying, as believers, we have a responsibility to lead people into spiritual maturity. Do you get that? As believers, so if you're Christian, uh huh, uh -huh. if you believe in Jesus, you've been saved. Through the word of God, we're learning tonight that you have a responsibility. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Wow. You have a responsibility to lead people into spiritual maturity. Come on. Mm -hmm. Come on. You don't have just a responsibility to lead yourself to spiritual maturity. You have a responsibility to lead others into spiritual maturity. Wow. This means to actually care about people's souls. It means to be invested and not having a compartmentalized Christian life. Mm -hmm. Like North America. We love having a compartmentalized Christian life. Church is only on Sundays from this time to this time. Other than that, don't touch me. <laughs> don't talk to me about what I need to do. Don't talk to me about how I need to live. Don't talk to me about responsibility. Don't talk to me about participating. Don't talk to me about engaging. Don't talk to me about attendance. Don't talk to me about how much I read my Bible. Don't talk to me if I go to city group or not. Don't talk to me if I'm going to campus rally. Don't talk to me if I go to church or not during the week. Don't talk to me. It's because my Christian life is just on Sundays. Paul's trying to kill that. That our Christian life has to do way, way more Amen. than just making sure that we're fulfilling a religious duty. Yeah, yeah, that's true. He's saying we're called Amen. to bring people into spiritual maturity, Amen. which means that we have to care. It means that we must be invested. It means that when you're tired, 
but your brother or your sister don't have groceries, you're going to go and invest in them. It means that when you don't want to have the conversation because your sister or your brother is walking towards sin, you're going to go and have the conversation even though it's uncomfortable for you. This means that when you don't want to pray for yourself, God is asking you to pray for yourself and for your brother and your sister in Christ. Yeah, that's true. You have to be invested. This means that you actually have to turn an eye to people, not turn the blind eye towards people. Notice how Paul wasn't saying this to the church's leadership. <laughs> he was writing this to the entire church. Amen. Oftentimes, church leadership can make two big mistakes. Number one, we prioritize numerical growth over spiritual growth. And second, we prioritize people's comfort over their discipleship. Ooh, that's good. We oftentimes make those two mistakes. We oftentimes lead the church to become a spiritual infant that never matures spiritually. And one of the most dominant attributes of children is that they think it's about them. So what happens when we lead our churches to just reach an infancy stage in their spiritual growth? Then what Jesus saved us for doesn't get accomplished. We have a task which is to tell others about the message of reconciliation. But when you're a spiritual infant and you have a mindset that it's all about you, that it's about what God can do for you, the, the one thing that Jesus saved us for, which is to have a heart for the cause, and, and that heart for the cause is to tell others, that never gets done. We, we, we as church leadership, because we prioritize numerical growth and we prioritize your comfort over your discipleship, you know what we do for you? The American church, not just Crave Church, I'm talking about the whole church. You know what we've done as church leadership during this last decade or maybe two last decades or even more? We've disabled you. We've made people spiritual paralegics. They can't walk or run. This is why we give up when a moment of suffering comes. This is why a trial dictates our faith. You know, trials are supposed to strengthen our faith. Amen. Read James. Trials produce perseverance. Mm -hmm. Amen. And I want to say something about suffering because, you know, it talks about it a little bit here. Um, your suffering is to test your faith mm -hmm. because it's only until you're placed in the fire that you really know what you believe in. Mm -hmm. That's true. That's true. Look what Peter did. Peter tells God, I'm going to prison and death. Mm -hmm. All the way to death, Jesus. I'm following you all the way. Mm -hmm. That's what he believed. But it wasn't what he really believed. Because when a 13-year-old little kid, girl, says, hey, you look like a Galilean. No, I'm not. I don't know that. He denied it because he was afraid. See, tests in life really teach you not what you think you believe. They teach you what you really believe. And that's not a bad thing. So if you're suffering, there comes a moment in your life Whereas a leadership, we must teach you to mature. And part of maturity is leaving infant childish mentalities. Mm -hmm. it's true. And childish mentalities will tell you that it's all about you. Mm -hmm. Because look at, the ch look at children, right? They cry whenever they don't get what they want. They throw a tantrum when mom and dad don't buy them what they want at the supermarket or at Walmart or wherever, at whatever. When they're not happy, they get angry and they become brats. Okay, doesn't this sound familiar? Spiritually? And this is what happens when we don't mature. And the reason why a lot of churches, the reason why a lot of Christians are not maturing is because the leadership doesn't care. But what's interesting is that Paul's not writing to the leadership. He's writing to the whole church. So that's the leadership, the mistake, right? What, which I spoke about. Paul's not really just addressing leadership, but I'm just, I'm just talking about what's happening in the North American church. Now, the members, on the other hand, they can make another mistake. And that is, they see the church as a hobby. It's just a cool thing to do on Sunday. But Paul is telling the entire church, it's our heart's cause to show the gospel. But not only that, we need to have a heart to invest time in maturing believers in their relationship with Christ. What are you doing to mature those that are around you in Christ? 
What are you doing to invest in someone that you see every day? I mean, some of you, you go to the Starbucks every single day and the same barista attends to you and makes your coffee. What have you done? Are you praying for that person? Some of you stand at a bus stop every single morning to go to work and you see the same group of people in that bus stop. What are you doing to share the message of reconciliation to them? I've been seeing them for years. Some of you have neighbors that you greet every single day. But do you have a heart for your neighbors? Do you know how our church started? With my neighbors. That's how Crave Church started. With my neighbors. Some of them are here, right here, right now, today. Sitting, leading with me. But how about you? Now, Paul gives us three things to help others mature spiritually. And the first one is the understanding of Jesus' life, death, and resurrection. And we see that when he tells, and, and, and we're going to read this as we go. In verse 28, we're going to reread it. He says, so we tell others about Christ. So if you read the New Testament, the majority of the time, we're being reminded and we're being told of who Jesus Christ is and what he did for us on the cross. Just imagine how we started our review today. Seven titles of who Jesus is. And we're being told because it first must begin with Christ. This is very key for us when we're helping believers mature in their walk with Jesus. So if you don't know where to start when it comes to helping others mature in their spiritual life, it starts with you knowing who Jesus truly is, not what you think he is, or what somebody else said he is, or what you two told you that he was. You have to have your revelation of Jesus. You have to get connected to him to a place where you know that you know that you know. It's not because you heard someone's conviction tell you. Because some of you are convicted about Jesus because of the way that I preach and been preaching to you for seven, eight, nine years. But do you have a knowledge of who Jesus is personally to you? If you want to help believers and you want to help other people believe in Jesus, it starts with you knowing who Jesus is and then telling others what you've learned or are learning about Jesus. If you don't understand the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus, I'm going to tell you something. It is impossible for you to mature spiritually. And what you're going to end up with is a moralistic behaving religion. Wow. It's going to be about how you behave. And how well you perform. And this, in turn, will lead you to your willpower becoming the source of everything that happens in your heart instead of it being Christ. When you end up with religion, which is you trying to get good to get with God, the source of your power becomes your own willpower and not Christ. And this is why so many people walk away from their faith, give up on their faith, or turn their fists towards God because they never really actually had a transformation happen. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That's true. They were doing it with their own willpower. And maybe this is you. Maybe you're watching. And, and maybe you've come back to church. And maybe today's your first day back in church because, you know, the pandemic happened. A lot of things are happening. We're in a dark moment. And maybe you decided to give God another shot but you had given it to him before or, th- or so you thought you did because maybe what you tried was religion with the title of Christianity, which is you doing your best and you behaving your best and you earning God through moralistic behavior. But today Jesus wants to shed some light into your spirit, your soul and your heart. And he's saying, it's not about you because if the source of your power is you, you will only break yourself more. Like I've said all the time, anytime the broken tries to fix what is broken, it only breaks it all the more. You need a revelation and a connection with Jesus, not religion. You need Christ. See, the, the word of God tells us that everything that happens in the life of a follower of Jesus is due to the power that raised Christ from the dead, not ours. So the very first thing that needs to be established in a person's life when we're leading them to spiritual maturity is the gospel of Jesus Christ. This is where it starts. Understanding the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. This is, Paul is saying, you got to tell them about Christ. If you don't start there, you're going to mess up. 
And then he gives us the second thing, hearing God's warning, hearing God's warnings in his word. And we read that when Paul says, so we tell others about Christ, is the first thing, warning everyone. There's a second thing that helps us mature spiritually. An example of this was when God told Adam and Eve in the garden, you can enjoy everything, eat everything, build everything, touch everything, except the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. That was the instruction. Here comes the warning. He says, if you eat its fruit, you are sure to die. You want to know the truth? Here's the truth. Disobedience gives you a short reward, but a long regret. Feels good in a moment. You do enjoy it because disobedience tastes good in the beginning. But what you don't understand is that it has a high, high price. In the New Testament, God gives us a clearer warning. And he says this in Romans 6, 23, for the wages of sin is death. But the free gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus, our Lord. So watch this. God's warnings are assigned to us to not be subject under consequence so that we don't live in regret. Mm -hmm. This is similar to speeding in a school zone. <laughs> Driving at the school zone limit sometimes feels stupid. Someone say amen. amen. Feels ridiculous. Yes. And we easily think to ourselves, 30 kilometers an hour is way too slow. <laughs> Someone push it to 50 kilometers because 50 kilometers an hour is still pretty safe. Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. You know what you just did in that moment? You know what you just did? You just rebelled against the law. We rebelled against the law because we think that our law is better. <laughs> and the reality is this, you may think it's better, feel that it's better, and even rationalize it being better, but at the end of the day, you have to understand who you're rebelling against because in reality, the law yeah. is above you yeah. and it is above your opinion. Uh -huh. Just imagine telling the prime, the, just imagine, imagine telling the prime minister of Canada, I don't like your laws. So I'm going to, in my area, in my neighborhood, I'm going to make my own law. <laughs> you know what we'd call that? A revolt. <laughs> we'd call that a rebellion. And you would be subdued quickly. Because yeah. wow. you can't put your own law against an authority that is higher than you. Amen. That authority, you, you haven't understood who the authority is. And this is why some of us don't like the law. But guess what? We still follow them because if we don't, we will experience a long regret. <laughs> All right. So when you think about God and sin, it's the same thing. You may think your way is better. <laughs> you may feel that your timing is better. And you may even rationalize that what you're doing is better. But at the end of the day, when you sin, you are rebelling against God. God and God is and always will be above you and your opinion. Amen. That's true. God is above you. Amen. And God is above your opinion. I don't care what culture says. Yeah, that's true. I don't care what the voice of being progressive may want to dictate and indoctrinate in our generation's minds. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. God is God. Amen. God is above. Amen. God is higher. His thoughts are higher than ours. Amen. And at the end of the day, you know who we're going to give an account to? Not culture, yeah. not Instagram, yeah. not your haters, uh -huh. not your critics. Uh -huh. You're going to give an account to God. Yeah. God. Our problem is that we've misunderstood grace so much. See, because of grace... We don't see our immediate consequence to our sins and our dumb things. But without repentance, the truth is that our sins are piling up for the day where God will judge the world. Yeah. God will judge the world. Yeah. Acts 17, 31 says it. For he, God, has set a day for judging the world with justice. Amen. Amen. So God has love. But he's also a just judge. And I want you to listen to this next part, okay? So if you haven't focused, focus here. Our problem is we're confusing God's patience with tolerance to the point where if we even speak about justice, it bothers us. Almost turning us into entitled human beings 
that live in a way as if God owes us grace. Mm. Oh. Let me remind you, God owes you Amazing. nothing. Come on. Preach. And this is why it's called grace. Because it's unmerited. You're not a good person, neither am I. Yeah. Yeah. And if I can prove that to you, describe to me all the thoughts that you have in private. Mm -hmm. huh. Would you be willing to put them on the screen? Let me tell you right now, of course not. And if you think yes, or if you say yes, you're a liar. <laughs> <laughs> and this is what Paul is saying. If we want to help people mature spiritually, Come on. we must show them the warnings found in God's word. Yeah. Number three, receiving God's wisdom through teaching. So here's how Paul puts it. So we tell others about Christ. Uh -huh. First thing that he said, warning everyone, second thing, and here's the third, and teaching everyone with all the wisdom God has given us. Yeah. So it's important to get this order thing right. Yeah. We start with Jesus Christ first, then what he saved us from, yeah. which is the warning, yeah. and in third and the last place, how to live wisely. Yeah. In religion, behavior modification, how to live wisely, is where people start in the gospel. It doesn't begin with me, it begins with God. Yeah. Now this third one, is receiving a wise perspective that produces righteous and wise actions. Wow. Many people believe in Jesus. They understand what they're saved from, but they stop there. And guess what? They never wage war against their sin. Mm -hmm. They keep it as a pet because they think that receiving God's grace and being saved means that you just believe but then they forget something so... See, a lot of people nowadays, when they get saved, they believe that justification is enough. Justification is an instant, instant gift yeah. that happens through grace, where we're justified or reconciled. Yeah. Sanctification is a process where kind of like the sunrise gets brighter and brighter and brighter and brighter, our spiritual life gets brighter and brighter and brighter. And brighter. Yeah. The closer that we get to Jesus, the more we see our stains, yeah. and the more we want to ask him to wash us. But a lot of people just want to stay at justification, which is just having right standing with God and being pronounced as just because Jesus took your place. Mm -hmm. And therefore, they never end up fighting their sin. So they end up living however they want, doing whatever they want to keep them doing. And they go, well, you know, God's grace forgives me. And Jesus died on the cross for all my sins. Mm -hmm. You know what happens to people like this? They never mature spiritually. Yeah, that's true. They never, never mature spiritually. Maturity is seen in every area of your life. So for example, if you're married... You will see marriage, right, through God's wisdom, his perspective, wise perspective. You will see marriage as a place to be transformed by loving and serving your spouse. Yeah, that's true. Rather than seeing marriage as a place to be served and have your way. Yeah. If your parent, parents, listen up. I'm not a parent, just letting you know, but this is really good for you. Mm -hmm. If you're a parent, you will want your kids to make a great living. Yeah. Have financial stability. Mm -hmm. stability. Amen. Have a good career. But when you get the wisdom and the teachings of God's word, you will prioritize them knowing and having an intimate relationship with Jesus first. Amen. This is wise living in Christ through the teachings found in God's word. Yeah. It'll also be seen in a group of friends that you have. So if you surround yourself with bad company, your character is going to get corrupted. That's why 1 Corinthians 15, 33 says this, for bad company corrupts good character. Yeah. But see, a mature believer sees this, they understand this because of what the word of God teaches, and they make a change out of a desire to remain in Christ. And when you're in Christ, this will not be done by your willpower. It's done by the power of the Holy Spirit. Oh, yes, that's right. But what got you here to a place of a different perspective is God's word. Mm -hmm. It's his wisdom. As you mature spiritually in the wisdom of God, you simply say to yourself, I don't see how getting wasted and blacking out on a washroom floor is fun. Mm -hmm. True. Wisdom. Yeah. Yeah. Spiritual maturity happens when you have these three things. Yes. Understanding Jesus, the gospel, yeah. hearing God's warnings, and mm -hmm. receiving God's wisdom. Yeah. Wow. These three things lead us to a spiritual maturity that the church should possess. Amen. Not just know about. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. 
Oftentimes we're so stuck just knowing. Yeah. But we totally exclude living. Mm-hmm. All right, so here's my conclusion. I have two questions for you. Number one, what are you doing to mature spiritually? And you have to think now, yeah. not later. Yeah. Think today. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Well, but I'm new to this whole thing. Yeah, even better. Mature now. Hallelujah. How do you spiritually mature? These three things that we just talked about. And so are you going to mature? What are you doing to mature? Will you put this into practice? Or will this just be a really good message that you're just shouting praise God for in a chat? Or is this something that you're just going to simply acknowledge but never put to practice? Mm-hmm. Think now. See, in a regret, in, 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 in regret, people say things like this. I, I don't know what I was thinking. Mm-hmm. Many people live in regret. And when you ask them, why'd you do that? They go, I don't know what I was thinking. You know what? When you face God on your last day, I don't want you to live in regret and answer him by saying, I don't know what I was thinking. You will have to face God one day. You will. You will. Your spirit, your soul will present itself before God. And you don't want to show up there all carnal, without Jesus substituting your sin. Instead, you want to show up grateful, thankful, spiritually mature. And not live in regret. You're like, I don't know what I was thinking when I was on earth. I'm so sorry. Forgive me. Too late. God's patience will run out one day. And he will judge and he will be just and he will not call the guilty innocent. Right now, you have time. I pray that you don't live in regret on the most important day of your life, which is Judgment Day. And this is not for you to, because heaven is not for people that are afraid of hell. Heaven is for people that are in love with Jesus. So this is not for you to be like, oh, I'm going to get scared into heaven. Screw that, man. (laughs) No one can get scared into heaven because only a relationship with Jesus can get you into heaven. So please don't think that this is a tactic to manipulate you into scaring you into God. That won't work either. So even if I did scare you into God, it won't work because the only thing that allows us to be in heaven is to be in relationship and in intimacy with Jesus. So the first question is, what are you doing to mature spiritually? And second question for some of you, this will hit a little closer to home, is what are you doing to mature others spiritually? In other words, do you have a heart for the cause? Because as a church, we must keep moving forward, not give up or give in. We must keep building and reaching more souls for Jesus Christ. What are you doing to reach that neighbor, that group of people at the bus stop, the barista at your coffee shop, your coworkers whom you sit with, whom you sit with every day? What are you doing? What are you doing? Gina was telling me that there's a male lady that she sees every time she picks up an Amazon package. She orders a lot. She says, she's the person that God has placed in my heart to reach because it's here every day. The mail lady. The, the person that like, you know, where you pick up your mail. That lady. See, God places specific people in your path. Because God is hoping that you'll open your mouth and share the message of reconciliation. Yeah. You want to know why? Because the same way that God loves you, he loves them too. Amen. Amen. Let's close our eyes. Father in heaven, thank you so much for this moment that you've given us. We bless your holy name. Disturb us. Bother us that we may speak to people that have not found their hope in you, Jesus. I pray in the name of Jesus for a heart for the cause over Crave Church. May we become a church that loves people, that we may live with a heart for your cause. Thank you for this moment. We love you, Jesus. We pray we say, amen.